A blessed good morning. You know, you can tell the difference between a blessed person and a not so blessed person, though this is not absolute. When you ask someone, how are they doing? Now, someone would say, but if you would ask a uh, true servant of God, how are they are doing? They will say, I'm blessed. Can't complain, right? We are so blessed. It only means that uh, though we all have problems, it only means that the blessings of God surpasses our problems. The blessings of God are bigger than our problems, right? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Will you not tell him today what a wonderful message um, of that song? And um, this morning, we will be again talking about evangelism. We started our evangelism series last week when we, when we talk about um, growing the church. And uh, I pointed out that to grow the church, it must start with our attitude of I can. And God is not asking your cannots, God is asking for your cans. Right? Now, um, in our scripture reading this morning, it says, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. Philemon chapter 1, 4 to 6. Now, we can feel the tone of the voice of uh, Apostle Paul. This was actually a letter of Apostle Paul to Philemon. And um, as well as the, uh, the brethren that meets in, in this particular house. Now, regarding his love, and regarding his faith in Jesus Christ and all of the saints. Now, on the part of Philemon, we can feel and we can see his passion for serving God and sharing the gospel in this particular verse. Okay? Now, in, in, in other translation, okay, um, it was a partnership. It was a uh, partnership or sharing okay, in the faith. Okay. So this partnership, this sharing of the faith was born because Philemon has fully acknowledged that everything that he has, including the forgiveness of his sins, well, which brought him eventually salvation, it all comes from Jesus Christ. It all comes from God. And he does these things because of his partnership with Jesus Christ. Now, with an attitude of I can, passion, our passion will eventually or will naturally come out from us okay, in growing the church, in loving the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning, we will be talking about passion in growing the church. Our passion in Christ's church. What is passion? Passion, according to um, popular dictionary, it is an intense driving or overmastering feeling of or conviction, ardent affection, and sometimes it is called love. We will be talking about a few about our passion in growing the church. Number one is passion for the passion of Christ. To grow the church, we must have that passion, like what Philemon had. Passion in declaring the goodness of God, a partnership 
in sharing the gospel. So to grow the church, number one, we must have a passion for the passion of Christ. A truly converted person to Christianity and claiming to be a Christian or an ardent follower of Christ, that person will have a clear picture of what Christ went through leading him to the cross. Okay. Now, if we are this kind of person, it will be impossible. And I will repeat that. It will be impossible not to feel the pain and the hurt that Jesus felt. It will be impossible for our, you know, for our hearts not to be crushed by what Jesus did. It will be impossible for, for us for our hearts, for our, you know, our, our hearts not to feel that pain that Jesus went through when he walked that streets going to the mount in Golgotha, in Calvary, and eventually be crucified on that cross. Now, he went through with all of that because of his great love for you and me. Now, to grow the church, we must have a passion for that passion of Christ. What Jesus did on the cross must motivate us to grow his church. Now we grow his church by spreading his message of the cross or the message of the cross, the message of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the message of the cross? Well, number one is about love. And the next thing about the cross, about Jesus Christ is humility. Humility. I have this t-shirt when I was a kid that says, it's hard to be humble when you are as handsome as I am. Somebody gave that to me when I was a kid. And I still remember that quote. And guess what? I think uh, I wore that shirt for just two times. <laughs> but anyway. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Now, the question, what does that mean? Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Well, it means humility. Humility. In verse 6, though he is God by nature, he did not consider equality with God. Okay. Something to be used to his own advantage. Okay. Now, what does that mean? To be used in his own advantage. Now, if Jesus okay, did not have that humility in him, and considered himself equal with God, you know what? Jesus would not have died on the cross. He would not have died on the cross if he did not have that humility. He would not have experienced those pains. And those are for his own advantage, right? But Jesus Christ did not took that path. He took the path of humility for our own sake for our own advantage so that we will not die with our sins, so that you will not die with your sins and I will not die with my sins. So this is what is meant by humility. Humility, as uh, C.S. Lewis once said, is not thinking less of yourself, but rather thinking of yourself less. Now, in your relationship with one another, let us take the path of humility. By thinking of ourselves less and thinking of others above and better than us. You know, the only thing that will hurt, that will hurt you is your ego. Right? The only thing that will hurt you if you think other, if you are, if you think yourself better than others is your ego. But Jesus Christ tells us the other way around. Otherwise, we must take the path of humility. In doing so, we are following the pattern of Jesus Christ. And note that this is not for our own advantage, but for the advantage of our fellow, because we are manifesting Jesus Christ in our lives towards them so that they 
to can have the hope of eternal life that is in you. Now in verse 7, Jesus said, Rather, he, pertaining to Jesus Christ, made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Now can you imagine what Jesus did for you and me? He made himself nothing. Can you imagine that? Now, can you imagine what does that mean? To make to, to made himself nothing. It means that Jesus, he puts aside everything that belongs to him. He puts it aside. You know, his place in heaven. His place in heaven, his godship, his sovereignty. He puts it aside. When he came down here on earth, he became nothing of value. Now, do you know the only place in the society for a person at that time who has no value? The only place for that person during that time, if you have no value, if you don't own anything, if you have nothing, is to become a servant, is to become a slave. That's the only place you have in the society. Slave. You will be owned by somebody. Okay. Guess what? That is what Jesus took. He took the path of servanthood. Because he made himself nothing. You know, Jesus could have been born into a regal or into a royal family. Or he could have been born into a middle class uh, family, to say the least. But no, he wasn't born to a regal or royal family. He wasn't even born to a middle class family. He was born into a low class family and took the path of the slavery along the way. In verse 8, and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Ultimately, the price of humility of Jesus Christ is death on the cross. According to some historians, the most wretched of deaths is the cross. According to Josephus, according to Paulus, a Roman jurist, the cross is the most severe punishment. And according to most historians, the cross is the most gruesome punishment ever known to man. You see, Jesus Christ took the path of humility and he took the cross. The most gruesome way to die. You know, the cross my dear brethren and friends, the cross is not a symbol, you know, to ward off vampires. No. The cross is not a symbol to ward off those evil spirits. No. No. Let us not think so little of the cross. It is not for, you know, if you have an evil spirit, you know, in the Philippines, they do this. And they will spit on their finger. And then they do that. And sometimes, I don't know why. You know, we think so little of the cross. But the cross is not for those things. See? The significance of the cross is far bigger than that. It is far more weightier than that. The cross signifies the atoning death of Jesus Christ onto which Jesus' blood was shed. Galatians chapter 3, 13 to 14. You know, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Curse is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, because in him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. You know, Jesus Christ, he was beaten by the Roman soldiers. Jesus Christ was mocked by the people. Jesus Christ was flogged and he was scourged by the soldiers. He was wounded for us and he shed his blood. 
You know, Jesus Christ bore the cross for our sins. The cross made us alive because we were dead in our sins. The cross canceled all the debts that we should have paid. The cross canceled all the charges brought against us. The cross is what stood between us and eternal condemnation in hell. The cross is our victory over Satan. The cross is what will bring us to heaven. The cross made us triumphant. Amen. The cross made us victorious. Colossians chapter 2, 13 to 15. Now let that passion of Christ be so ever powerful reminder for all of us to fuel your passion, to fuel my passion, to deliver its message to the people so as to grow his church. Let us always go to the passion of the cross, to the passion of Christ, and remind ourselves how rich we are and how blessed we are today. Because without the cross, we are nothing. Because without the cross, we are all still sinners. The second is we must have the passion for the Great Commission. Aside from having the passion for the passion of Christ, we must have the passion for the Great Commission. To grow the church, my dear brethren, we all, have, we all must have the passion for that Great Commission that Jesus Christ tells us. Now, but here are some interesting statistics. In the, uh, uh, from the Barna group, if you would go to barna.com, you can find uh, this on their website. It says, churchgoers, there is actually a question. Have you heard of the Great Commission? 51% says, no, I have not heard of the Great Commission. 6% are not sure. 25%, yes, we heard about it, but I cannot recall the exact meaning. Only 17% said yes, and they know the meaning. Now, knowledge of the Great Commission by generation. Elders in the, in the first uh, line there have heard and remembered the Great Commission. Elders, 29%. The boomers, 26%. Generation X, 17%. The millennials, 10%, and so on and so forth. Now, what does this survey mean? Now, before I answer that question, I will have to ask another question and answer it first. Now, my question is, what is the word commission? Commission is an authorization or command to act in a prescribed manner or to perform prescribed acts. It charge authority to act for, in behalf of, or play in place of another. That is the word commission. Now, the word great commission, my dear brethren, is not actually in the Bible. The word great commission, you cannot read that in the Bible, okay, per se. However, the essence of the word great commission are there in the Bible. Okay? It is only coined, according to what I read, uh, in the late 17th century. The word great commission was only coined in the late 17th century to pertain to Matthew chapter uh, 28, and in Mark chapter 16. The essence is actually there. Okay? Now, I can only surmise two reasons why it was called, or it is called, the Great Commission. Well, number one, because it was given by our great God. Okay? Our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why it's called Great Commission. The number two, okay, it is called great because it involves the salvation of one's soul. So that's why it is called great. Now, the next question is, what specifically is the command? If we will go to Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20, there is what they call the Great Commission. I know that you are all familiar with Matthew 28, 18 and 20. Now, here is the thing. 
Many thought, the way I did, many thought that the command in the Great Commission is actually the command go. Okay? But actually, if we will study deeper, the command is not actually to go. The imperative, according to the Greek structure of this uh, particular verse, the imperative there or the command is not to go. But the command is to make disciples. That is the command. The process is actually three ways. Go, baptizing, and teaching. Those are the process that we need to do in order for us to go and make disciples. In order for us to achieve the Great Commission. The commission for all of us, my dear brethren and friends, is to make disciples. How do we do that? Number one, we need to go. We need to go out. Going out means two things. Number one is we have to engage to the people. Last week, we talked about how we should, we, we should engage and we, how we could engage to people. Number one is literally you have to go out. And number two, nowadays, because of technology, in your house, in the comfort of your house, you can actually share the gospel. You can share the gospel. You use the social media to share the gospel. So the command go is actually letting the message that is in you to the people. How do you do that? Be creative on how you do that. And the next process is the, the gospel tells us baptizing them. And how do you do that? You teach the very essence of the gospel. You convict, you, you convict the people by teaching them the word, by planting the word, by planting the seed. So remember, my dear brethren, good news is never a good news when you will not share it. It will only be a good news if you will share the good news. Now, we must go out there and talk to people, you know, use the social media, teach the gospel to people. We must engage to people. Now, in the book of Mark, in his version, it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Again, the command is not to go. The command is to preach. That is the imperative. That is the command. We are to preach the gospel. We are to proclaim the gospel. Okay? And the gospel is about is all about Jesus Christ. Now, going back to the question a while ago with regards to the survey. Okay, what does the survey mean? If you will look very carefully, it only means that 83% of churchgoers did not have any clue what the Great Commission is. If you will add 51, 6, 25, that is 83%. They don't have any clue what the Great Commission is all about. And it is also, it means it is the minimum percentage of many churchgoers who don't know their role in the church and are not doing what Jesus asked them to do. Now my question is, do we know our calling? I know. We all know our calling. We were tasked and asked by our great Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to make disciples, to preach the gospel. That is the one of the very essence of your Christianity, of my Christianity. And the 17%, they knew the Great Commission. But here is the thing. Are they doing what Jesus told them to do? Are they preaching the word? No, the survey doesn't state that they are doing the Great Commission. The survey only says that they know what it means. But it doesn't say that they are doing the actual Great Commission. The question is, are we doing the Great Commission? My dear brethren, in order for us to grow the church, in order for us to show our love for Christ's church, is we must have that passion for the Great Commission. Number three is we must have the passion 
for compassion. Passion for compassion. Compassion in meeting people's physical needs. Jesus Christ, Matthew 15, 32, and Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry for they might faint on the way. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed the sick, Matthew 14, 14. This were, these are just a few of the examples how Jesus Christ showed his compassion to the people by providing what they needed and also healing the sick. Jesus not only preached the word, he did not only preach the word about compassion, he also lived the word compassion. He lived the very essence of the word what compassion is all about. He embodied the word compassion. Now, Apostle James re echoed that faithful Christians must live with compassion. In James chapter 2, verses 14 down to 17, it talks about faith in action. Just like our faith in action, we must act on our compassion. As we live out our faith, so we must also live out our compassion to our fellow who are in dire needs. Now, faith in action, and so does compassion is in action, must be in must. Compassion in meeting people's spiritual needs. In Matthew chapter 18, 11 to 13, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If any man has hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 91 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 91 or 99 which have not gone astray. In the same way, your Father in heaven does not want any of these little children to be lost. Passion for the lost souls. Now, the compassion of Jesus, the compassion of God, transcends materiality, for it focuses on our soil, on our souls. Now, Jesus was sent to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins so that we can cross over that great chasm that separates eternal glory and eternal damnation. My dear brethren, we must have the passion for compassion for our fellow, for their souls. Uh, I often, uh, oftentimes mention about this. You know, we must remember how someone shared the gospel to us. Do you still remember that person that shared to you the gospel? I know that most of us here, if not all of us, somebody, somebody shared the gospel to you because that person had that compassion for your soul. Because he had something, he has something so precious that he just cannot contain it within himself, that he shared it with you. I want you to remember that. And do the same thing to somebody else that you love. Do the same thing for somebody and have the same compassion that that someone so in you that shared the gospel to you. We must have the same passion that same passion for compassion for the lost souls. To grow the, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, we must have a passion for the gospel. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is what? It is the power of God. For what? For salvation. To salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greeks. 
You know, there can be no church growth without the gospel, without the seed. There can be no church growth without us planting the seed. We must have the passion for sharing the gospel. For it is the gospel that saved us. Do you know that God uh, entrusted you with the most important thing in the universe? Do you know that? Do you know that you that you have it in you, the most precious commodity, if I will put it, more precious than any known metal to man. You have the gospel, because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It saved you, right? You can now boast or be proud that you have the gospel, that you have that hope of salvation because of what? Because you have the gospel, right? And now in your hand is what will save other people as well. Now, Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, he longed to come to Rome. He longed to come to Rome to, be, to encourage them in their faith and to be encouraged by them. It's a, a, a uh, two-way traffic, as we call it. Apostle Paul would, would encourage them and he would be encouraged by their faith. Now, in so doing, Apostle Paul said, I want to share the gospel not only to you, but also to them, the Gentiles. I want to share the gospel with them because it is the power of God for everyone. And Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Even if he was shipwrecked, he was put in prison, he was beaten also. He is not ashamed of the gospel. He will take everything that comes into his life just to share the gospel. Psalm 40, 9 and 10, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know I have not hidden your righteousness with my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. My dear brethren, we must have the same passion like these people. We must have that passion for the gospel, a passion to learn about it, to meditate upon it day and night, and a passion to proclaim the gospel. You know, may the gospel be forever on our lips and ready to be shared with the lost people. Finally, I save the best for last. To grow the church, we must have the passion for Jesus. There can be no gospel without Jesus Christ. There can be no church without Jesus Christ. Nothing can be told. And nothing can be grow without our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For through him in all things were made and without him nothing was made that has been made. You know, for without Jesus Christ, our faith will be useless. For Jesus Christ is the author and he's the perfecter of our faith. You know, look at what the apostles said about Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, Apostle Paul said, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. John chapter 6, verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, in Acts chapter 10, verse 43, Salvation exists in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. My dear brethren, the passion to grow the church of our Lord Jesus Christ stems from our passion 
from our love, from our devotion to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who owns the church. He must be the reason why we do what we do. Now, if we fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, if we focus our attention to Jesus Christ, now let me ask you this. Do you think we will not grow the church? If we will focus on Christ, do you think we will not grow the church? I don't think so. We will grow the church. We will grow his church. Do you know why I know that? Because God will give the increase. Amen. He will give the increase. God will make it grow. The church will never die. Why? Because we have a living God. The church will never die. Because we have a living God. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. I planted, you planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. If we will have that passion for Jesus Christ, my dear brethren and friends, we will go to church. And we will see more and more people so truly blessed. And we will hear more and more people when you ask them, how are you today? And they will say, I'm truly blessed. I cannot complain. I was talking to Brother uh, Kennedy. <laughs> Sorry. I think I need to uh, have my uh, memory vitamins. <laughs> and I was talking to Brother Tony a while ago. How are you, brother? Cannot complain. I'm truly blessed. See, if we have more people like that, this world will be a wonderful place to live. Right? There will be more love, more humility, more compassion, and you will see more people smiling because they have Jesus Christ in their hearts. Amen. You know, my dear brethren, let us go out there. Let us spread and plant the word of God. Let us proclaim our Lord Jesus Christ. Let the passion of Christ, his passion on the cross, what he went through leading to his death on the cross, his compassion for all of us, and the compassion of those people who shared the gospel to you, fuel our passion, fuel our love, fuel our you know, devotion for Christ and those that are lost. To grow the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have, we, sh we must have the passion for the passion of Christ. We must have the passion for the Great Commission. We must have the passion for compassion. We must have the passion for the gospel and finally the passion for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My dear brethren, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And finally, let me leave all of us with this final thought. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast about. For this obligation has been entrusted to me. How terrible it would be for me if I did not preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. My dear brethren and friends, the gospel is yours for those who have not yet accepted the Lord. And who wants to have that smile on their faces and to be truly saved? We invite you to come forward, repent of your sins, and be baptized. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? God bless everybody.